Mr. Rollins. Carol. Ben Rowley. Does everyone have a handout for today? If you need one of these, raise your hand. We'll make sure you get one. Okay, good. There we go. The armor of God. We're wrapping up the book of Ephesians here this morning. We're going to end this great letter with one last overarching command. He's going to say, coming up in a minute, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Now that's where we're at. We'll work our way there in just a minute. Let's recap so far what we've looked at since we started this book. Really, let's recap our spiritual bank account. Adoption, acceptance, these are all the things that are in a bank account that you own that you cannot see. Your spiritual bank account. And you see, once you realize and grasp that all these things are yours, it makes you a victorious overcomer out here in the world. When you realize all these things, adoption, acceptance, God accepts you now, He says, yep, you're mine. I own you. Your name's written here. I've obliterated your sins. I don't remember them anymore. You are mine. What do you do with that, Tim? All you can do is just praise God. Thank you. And rejoice. Redemption, that is, he's bought you out of the slave market. Forgiveness. Wisdom, inheritance, who would you rather inherit from? Uncle Harry or Jehovah? The seal of the Holy Spirit, life, grace, citizenship, and then in short he says, in case he forgot one, every spiritual blessing. Well, thank you, young man. That's what he taught first three chapters. Now, in chapter four, he starts teaching on unity. He gave us instructions on how to live out the Christian faith. Chapter four, verse one, he said, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. Now, remember, <coughs> as we get on with this, when he wrote this, all right, he's chained to someone just like this. He's got a chain on his wrist. Chained to this man here. Right next to him. So when he says. I therefore. The prisoner of the Lord. You understand why he said it. He's in jail. I therefore. The prisoner of the Lord. I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling. With which you were called. Or vocation by saying your Bible. With all lowliness and gentleness, long suffering, bearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, as you were called, and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Chapter 2, we learned about how God saved us. Chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved. Through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So, we're saved by grace. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. A favor done without expectation of return. The absolutely free expression of the loving kindness of God. 
to men finding its only motive in the bounty and benevolence of the giver, or unearned and unmerited favor. You and I are saved by grace, through faith. Now keep in mind, both of these come from God, and you do not possess these qualities on your own. Hence the rest of the verse, it says, and that not of yourselves. Verse 9, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, Greek word poema. We are his poem, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. Chapter 5, we learn the proper way to walk. Walk in love, walk in the light, walk in wisdom. Also last week we discussed marriage. The married woman, the wife is to submit to her husband. Same way she submits to the Son of God. The husband is to love his wife the same way Jesus loves his church and gave himself for her. And lastly, before we move on, last week I encourage you to go to the great dispenser of time, buy back the remaining time you have left, and put it to good use. Remember? That's where we left off. Redeeming the time means to buy back. Buy back the remaining time that you have left because you don't know how long that is. Buy it back from God and put it to work. Paul wrote in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So redeem the time, Paul said, because the days are evil. Now let's pick it up where we left off. Chapter 6. Here in chapter 6, Paul's going to show us how we can get the victory over our enemy when he's out to get you. Because you, Christian, now have a bullseye right on your chest. Since you became a believer, you've got a bullseye on you, and you have a real enemy that's out to get you. Aren't you glad I told you that this morning? So when we look at this armor here, bear in mind the Apostle Paul, as I said, is chained to someone like this. Now I asked Carol to give us a picture, and that's a great job, exactly what I was looking for here. Now let's pick it up here in verse 10, and let's wrap up this book. All right? He says, finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now right, right off the bat, We've got all three Greek words for power. All in one verse. You see that? That's never happened before in the New Testament. All the words for power are all in one verse. A, B, they all belong to God. C, they're yours. They're yours. We're the walking in. The first word is the word dynamo. Where it says, be strong. That's to strengthen. To become strong like Samson. Or Hezekiah. Who had some kind of cancer and God healed him. Boy, talk about redeeming the time. Not only did he redeem the time. The, God made the, the shadow on the hourglass on the, on the sundial go backwards. So that's dynamo. Of course, the same Greek word where our word dynamite comes from. The second is the word kratos, which is, means power. It's also a proper name for God. Panta kratos means omnipotent or all-powerful or almighty. Kratos. Third word is iskus, means might, physical strength. Kind of like Superman, who can bend steel with his bare hands. Now all of these things, this power, all belongs to the Lord Most High. However, 
this power and might is available to protect you. When you do what he says. Do what he said. Be obedient to what he's going to tell you. And these things are yours. Verse 10 again. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye or you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, immediately, only one thing comes to mind for this 59-year-old when I read that, wiles of the devil, and that is wily coyote. Super genius. Wily coyote. He never gives up, if you remember. He keeps trying time after time after time after time after time after time to take me out. It's the same thing. But you see, you can't go. Meet me. Meep. There's no meep in here. Here, you can't go meet. Here, you gotta plant them and you gotta stand. And withstand his attack. You see, the error is to go meet me, which would be cut bait and run. But before you get into the battle, you must put your, your clothes on, your spiritual armor. So, invisible enemy, invisible armor. You can't see the enemy here. Sitting right there in pew one, you don't see him. You know, Jesus said, the enemy here waits for you not to understand. And he comes... And he snatches away everything good out of your heart. And you walk out of here in unbelief. Except for when you're not ignorant of his wiles. That's one of his tricks. That's one of his schemes. Matthew chapter 13. When those that don't understand the word. It says the enemy comes and snatches away the word that was sown in his heart. That's one of them. That's what he opens up. That's his acne box of dot, dot, dot. All right, back to wiles. Greek word, naturally, is the word methodia. Perfect. As if the Warner Brothers cartoon folks must have looked up the word too. Method, methodia. I translated that in my Bible stratagems to use that old war word to work by method think about it for instance the devil is on record as saying this about you thus revealing his method this quote comes from an old argument the devil had with God in the oldest book of the Bible Job and the devil said this to God. He said, skin for skin. Yea, all that a man has will he give for his life. Now that fact will give you a clue as to his methods. The devil thinks you will do anything to save your own hide. That's his method here. He studied mankind forever, and the end result is he thinks you will cut bait and run every time when you are faced with adversity. Skin for skin. All that a man or woman has, he will give in exchange for... Wow. And what do you do at the end of the age when Matthew says, right, at that time... You will be handed over. You will be delivered up to tribulation and killed. And then it says, and many will fall away. Naturally. Because the devil has studied man his whole life. And he knows. And here it is here. Skin for skin. So his method is against you. When it gets hot in the kitchen, you'll bail. When it gets hot in the kitchen, you'll cut bait and run. When it gets hot in the kitchen, you will take the mark of the beast in order to buy or sell if you're hungry enough. That's where this is going. 
Same M.O. It hasn't, it's in the same Acme book of tricks. And it hasn't changed. You'll do anything to save your own hide. And when it hasn't rained on earth for three and a half years, and here comes the Antichrist who I have named the Zephyr Hills man. And he's going to ride into town in a great big blue refrigerated. You know those refrigerated trucks? They got all those little droplets on them because they're cold. Ice cold water. That's what he's three and a half years with no rain. And here he comes like the good humor man. Ching -ling 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 -ling. Who is it? The Antichrist. Here's water. You can have all the water that you want. All you got to do, friend, is just one little thing. Write down on here that you agree to follow me. It's not a religious mark. This is just so you can go to Publix and buy water. Or you can go down here to Walmart and buy diaper. That's all. No one can buy or sell except he that has the mark. Now Satan's got people pay. He says that's what people are going to do. These are the tricks that he uses to get you. And Paul's trying to get you to walk around like that. By various spiritual things to protect you. Now regarding you personally, there are probably other methods the devil could use against you. Pornography, drugs, alcohol, same-sex attraction, marriage infidelity. Here's one I could get Vinny. Girls. No, not yet, huh, Ben? At least we give him until he's four, right? <laughs> but knowing what we know now, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God so that you will be able to stand against the stratagems of the devil. But notice in this verse, he tells you how to win the fight when it happens to you. One more verse of what's going on before we look at the solution. Verse 12, it says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. All right, stop there. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. That means that your fight, your struggle, it's not against your boss at work. It's not against your child. But something's gotten into your child. It's not against the person who just seems to hate you for no reason whatsoever. You gotta peel back the layers that add onion and look deeper to discover who your real enemy is. You wrestle not against flesh and blood. When people hate you for no reason, there's a spiritual reason for it. You gotta dig deeper to find out the problem is here. What the problem is here. Starts here with the word but. So my serious issue is not with my boss, but, and I just picked that out, boss. I mean, I'm the senior pastor here. God's my boss. I've got no issues with you, Lord. <laughs> but you might. You might work with eight or ten people and your boss loves them all except you. And he just hates you. He's filled with hate. Sit down with my wife at lunch sometimes. She'll tell you stories. People that hated her, punched her in the face for no reason at all when you didn't do anything. Because you got to peel back the layer and look and see. It's the spirit inside a person that hates you, not the person. It's a bigger, it's a deeper fight than that. That's what the Bible is saying. So again, he says the struggle is against principalities, or rulers, against powers, Greek word exousia means authorities, against rulers, cosmokratos, meaning the prince of this world, or Satan, of the darkness of this age, 
or against spiritual hosts of wickedness, Greek word paneros, proper name for the devil, or evil. You know, in the Lord's Prayer, he says, uh, uh, deliver us from the evil, paneros, the evil one. So again, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age or world, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now how's that for your enemy? This is perhaps the greatest obstacle and struggle that you face on a daily basis. And that is that you were most likely unaware to the fact that that it's not the person that's causing the grief in your life. It's a spiritual issue that's behind it. The person who on the outside masquerades as a doctor or lawyer, your mother-in-law, enemy at your job, even at a higher level, the president of a country, a senator or a member of Congress, a policeman or even an animal. Ever seen a devil dog before? Some nasty, vicious, mean, evil dog. Demons, hello? Demons, in, in, demons possess dogs too. They possess pigs. Jesus sends them into pigs. Animals can be possessed by demons as well. All right, there's the enemy. Now, what do we do about it? Verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. All right, great. Here are some clothes I can put on to endure this fight. Verse 14. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So, truth. That's just walk in truth. Walking in the truth protects you. Walking in the truth protects you. I know for a fact, because my Bible says, that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. That's walking in the truth. You are walking in the truth. You see, you cannot hurt me because I am a child of God and no weapon formed in this world can hurt me because my Bible says it. Therefore, it's the truth. That's your belt, isn't it? Yes. Gird your waist with truth and the breastplate of righteousness. Now remember, you're chained to righteousness. That is, you can't help but go out here and do good in this world. You're chained to it. You are a, a, Paul, a Paul said you are a slave of righteousness. You're a slave. You used to be chained to sin. Paul was chained to this man. But you as a Christian are chained to righteousness. Walk in it. Walk in it and the devil won't be able to get you. He won't be able to attack you. That's like I always say, anytime you're depressed or down and out, go out and do something good for someone and it'll lift like a fog. Because you are chained to righteousness. Walk in these things. Walk in truth. Nothing can harm you. Nothing can hurt you. Nothing can take you out. The child of God. Righteousness. The breastplate hair covering your vital organs and righteousness. Go out here and do some good to some people today. If you find yourself depressed or in a fog, don't think about yourself. Think about others. Do something for somebody else. And watch it live. Verse 15. Verse 15, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. All right, now this suggests a readiness to go out with the gospel of peace and therefore 
an invasion into enemy territory. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. The shield of faith. When temptations burn, when circumstances are adverse, when doubts assail, when shipwreck threatens, faith looks up and says, I believe God. I believe God. And I've got the victory. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation. Salvation protects the most vital part on your body is your head. The helmet that God provides for you is salvation. Hallelujah. Who can hurt you? You know, my old hero of NASCAR was Dale Earnhardt. And he even had a helmet on. And died from cracking his skull. The helmet that God gives you is not going to crack. He's given you the helmet of salvation that no one can harm. No one can penetrate. Your name is engraved. Your name's written in the book of life. No one... When Paul realized that he said, what shall we say to these things? Right. If God be for us, if God, let's, let's personalize that. If God, no, let's personalize that like they taught me in seminary. If God is for you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you. If God is for you, who on this blessed earth can be against you? Who is greater than God? Who can take you out? As far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed their transgressions from them. God has amnesia with your sins. I'd say that's rather good news this morning from someone who had a long list of them. That's the helmet of salvation. Don't matter what you do, devil. The fox's book of martyrs might be that thick, full of people that they fed the lions. But you can't touch me. You can't touch me. Go and meet your maker. Fine. You want to penalize me? Make me live a while longer. Those guys don't get it that say that. Prepare to meet your maker. All right, let's go. Bring it on. Hallelujah. I'm ready. Again, everything goes around Indiana Jones for me. Remember? Remember when we're on the boats? And he says, are you ready to die? He goes, my soul's ready. Oh, <laughs> Mr. Jones, is yours? And that's the question. Is your soul ready today? Are you ready today? Satan takes people out. People, Christians die in this. Have you ever heard of a Christian that's ever died before? Yeah. Or was mistreated? Or the devil took them out? Eleven of the apostles died that way. But no one can touch your salvation. No one can lay a charge against God's elect. All right. Lastly, what Paul calls the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now notice, please, everything else was for your defense. But the sword of the Spirit is your weapon. Matter of fact, it's your only weapon. It's the only weapon you have. And he tells you what that is. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Actually, it's not the Logos of God, but it's the Rhema of God. Now that means it's the spoken Word of God, not the written Word of God. You overcome the enemy the same way Jesus did when he was up on the mountain. Right? 
throw yourself down. Or all the things that he said to him. It is what? Written. Jesus did that as an example. To show you and I how you get the victory. Or your weapon, your sword that pierces the enemy is the spoken word of God. That's how you win this fight. The spoken word of God is your weapon. You know, the next time Satan wants to remind you of your past, you remind him of his future. I like to hear Michael Youssef say all the time, but that's right. It's the spoken word of God. I heard of this little kid, this boy at night, every time he turned the lights off, Satan would speak to him under his bed. And he'd say, you're not saved. So the boy opened up his Bible to Romans 10, 13, and it says, Oh, call on the name of the Lord, I'll be saved. And he opened his Bible, and he slid it under his bed. <laughs> and he said, There it is. Read it for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> then it was nothing but crickets. You see, that's why Jesus says in John 8, 32, And you will know the truth. And the truth will set, will set you, you free. It's not the, I read, I forget who it was who said it. It's not the power of God that sets you free. It's the knowledge of the truth. It's the knowledge of the truth. God is on your side. God is for you. What can anyone do against you? It is written in Revelation 12, 11. It says they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and, the testimony of his and by the word of their testimony. That is the blood You're in whom we have redemption through his blood. It's the blood is what washes away our sins, cleanses us from all unread. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. It's the shedding of the blood and the word of our testimony, just like that little boy told the devil. I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he's my Lord. And then you pull a polycarp and you say, do what, what thou wilt. If God is for you, who can be against you? We overcome by using our sword, the spoken word of God, Amen. while remembering that no weapon formed against you can prosper. All right, lastly, verse 18, he says, praying always with all prayer and some praying always, praying always. We read this earlier too, remember? In all things, praying in all things. In the 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, he says, in all things give thanks. Here he said, for all things give thanks. And now here he says, praying always. Then he says, in the Spirit. Now, for some people, that might be speaking in tongues. I don't speak in tongues. But praying in the Spirit means, well, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. Praying in the Spirit is a prayer that's not audible. I mean, the devil hears your prayers if you pray them out loud. But if you pray in your, if you pray within yourself, the devil doesn't, he's not a mind reader. He can't read your prayers. He can't read your mind. He doesn't know you commune with the Holy Spirit who's on the inside of you and the Holy Spirit stands before God. So that's my understanding. He's not just speaking to a select group. He's talking to all Christians. Praying in the Spirit is not praying out loud. It's praying. Sometimes I'll pray to God and admit my fears to Him. What I'm afraid of. But I'm not going to pray that out loud. I'm not going to tell Him. I can pray that without opening my mouth. I would believe to my understanding that's what praying in the Spirit is. Some people speak in tongues. I don't. They can pray in the Spirit in a, in, a, in a way that I certainly can. Let's wrap it up. Verse 19. His last prayer is, Send for me 
that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly. Isn't that good to know, Darren, that Paul needed prayer, he needed help to go out here and preach and to speak in front of others. We're in good company. Pray for me, he says, that utterance may be, that I may know what to say, what to preach, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, so that I may speak it boldly as I ought to speak. But that you also may know my affairs and how I'm doing. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister of the Lord, he will make all things known to you. Who am I have sent to you for this very purpose? That you may know our affairs, and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus.